Before I do start, I would like to acknowledge uh, the GRDC and particularly the uh, National Frost Initiative for supporting um, this, this um, research that uh, I'll be presenting to you uh, this afternoon. So the, my, my talk today is about the changing nature of frost risk and posing the question about whether or not this is a climate surprise. And so before we, we sort of try and answer that question, we need to understand what a climate surprise is. So climate surprise has been defined as an abrupt or a steady state change in climate that can trigger abrupt changes in physical, biological or human systems. Now, some examples of climate surprises that are already occurring, um, if we think about the unprecedented uh, rate of sea level decline, both um, in the Antarctic and the Ar Arctic. So in 2017, uh, about 4 million square kilometres less sea ice extent than there was back in the earlier part of the record, so significant declines in, in sea ice. One of the other climate surprises that yet, yet, uh, hasn't yet uh, started is this one around runaway climate change. So this is the potential for um, the trapped high-latitude high uh, methane and carbon that's caught up in permafrost when that does get released through temperatures and warming in the atmosphere, that adds, uh, and, uh, adds to the, the actual um, greenhouse gas forcing and increases or enhances the warming effect. But we are starting to see some climate surprises play out. Um, some examples here, particularly around temperature and rainfall. Um, so for those of you in the media that uh, have used the word rainfall bomb, um, certainly we've uh, have experienced uh, a few of those um, most more recently. When we talk about rainfall bombs, we're talking about unprecedented rates of, of, of rainfall. An example that I have here is, is with the occurrence of, of, of Hurricane Harvey in the US rainfall rates of, of one in a thousand years. So at, at peak times in Harvey, that rainfall was about 96 millimetres per hour. So think about your shower and think about uh, it, in, enhancing the, the rate of rainfall coming from that, that shower there. One of the other climate surprises that we've actually seen very recently too is the, the occurrence of three category four cyclones in the Pacific at one time. Never, never occurred before in, in the historical record. And in terms of temperatures, the unprecedented cold temperature snaps that we've had in North America on the East Coast, again, using this word bomb cyclone. So some very rapid declines in pressure and drawing um, very cold air from, from very high latitudes. So that's what we mean when we talk about climate surprises. And I'll pose to you that we do have some climate surprises in, in our minimum temperature records too. So this is a map of the trends in mean minimum temperatures across Australia. The areas highlighted in red show where there's warming. The areas highlighted in blue where there is cooling in that mean minimum temperature. So if we looked at across the, the nation as a whole, we would say mean minimum temperatures have been warming approximately 1.1 degrees Celsius since the beginning of the record. But what we do know is that the spatial pattern and the, the, the actual um, change in the data itself is much more complex than just looking at mean minimum temperatures. So what I've put up here is because we have temperatures, we're able to rank those temperatures from the very coldest, what we would say could be lower than in the sort of bottom 10%. Then we have the mean where most of the data clusters, that sort of 50th percentile. And then we've got the very extreme, the very warm end of the minimum temperatures, in this case, at the 90th percentile. And so you can see that we get this sort of classic bell-shaped curve here in terms of if we rank the data from coldest to warmest. We're also then able to look at the trends in these, um, these 10th, 50th and 90th uh, percentile values. 
And the, the map that I showed you before, the, produced by the Bureau, that represents the, the sort of 50th percentile, so that what happens in the sort of midpoint of the, of the record. What we have on this side is the 10th percentile, so that very cold end of the minimum temperatures, and we've got the very hot end, the 90th percentiles. So if we look at the, the, the 10th and the 90th percentiles, where you have uh, blue triangles, that means that the, the, the trend is going down, so things are getting cooler. The red triangles are where it's getting warmer. Any open triangle, one that's not colored, the trend is not statistically significant. So if we, um, if we now put all of those on a sort of comparable footing, what we can see is that the spatial pattern in these trends is actually much more complex than we first thought. So in the 10th percentile, we've got areas where there's consistent declines in minimum temperatures. When we look at the 50th percentile, we can see that some of those regions which were recording declines in the 10th percentile, the very coldest, still exist. But then when we get to the very hot end of the, of the spectrum, those have, have disappeared. And for those of you that like graphs as opposed to maps, um, there's some graphs there that show you what I'm talking about here. So we get a situation where you could have a decline in your 10th percentile, you could have a warming in your 50th percentile and a warming in your 90th percentile, or alternatively you could have a warming in your 10th, 50th, but a cooling in your 90th percentile. So we need to, I think, uh, understand that this, the, the warming that's occurring is actually much more nuanced than being a broad scale warming across all temperatures um, and, and all percentiles. So what we have done is we've looked at um, what these trends actually mean in terms of the frequency of frosts. And we've split that up into the different months, each map there representing a different month from April through to November. The areas that are highlighted in yellow are uh, suggesting no real change in, um, in the frequency of frosts. And when I talk about frosts, it's the Bureau's definition of frost, which is two degrees Celsius at the Stevenson screen. When we look at, say, June, July, and August, we see that there are some areas there which are colored in blue, which show an increase in the frequency of frost numbers. And in August, those areas that you see in very dark blue, so here, sort of around here and here, and over in WA, those are areas which having, have, uh, the, the trend is for an increase of, of five more events most recently as opposed to the earlier part of the record. And when I talk about the earlier part of the record, I'm talking about the 1960s to, to um, near to, to present. So what we can see is that there's some interesting changes in frost occurrence, particularly in um, August, September and October. And we have areas, say, in June and July, um, where there's been some marked declines in frost frequency, these areas marked in, in red here. That only tells part of the story. The other part of the story is, in fact, what we call the frost window. So it's the length of time between when you experience your first frost in the beginning of the year and your last frost. So we call that the, the window of occurrence. And if we look at the record, uh, uh, the temperature record from 1960 to, to near present, so we're looking at uh, 2015 in this case, the areas that are marked in blue show where the frost window has become much broader. The areas highlighted in red are where that frost window has actually shrunk. So what we can see is that there's some spatially coherent areas where the frost window has become broader. So the question is, is this because of earlier start to the, to the frost season or a later finish? These two maps show you the, um, the start and the end of the frost period. So the, the change in the first frost day, the areas highlighted in blue are showing where the frost window is starting earlier, in red where it's starting later in the year. And on, on the right-hand side, the areas marked in blue 
are where the frosts are occurring later in the season and the red are where they're finishing earlier. So what we can see is that there seems to be a much more spatially coherent pattern of later frost occurrence across the, the sort of southern parts of, of Australia. That earlier start to the frost window seems to be less coherent. And I'm sure many of you in the room um, probably don't need to uh, examples of, of where this, this late frost has actually had some significant impacts. Most recently, 2017, um, in vineyards and cereal crops, both in Victoria and South Australia, some significant damage from a frost on the 4th of November. Canberra itself had a significant number of, of cold nights or, fr or frosty nights um, with temperatures below two degrees, probably 16 more than on average. And we had a temperature of about minus 8.7 degrees recorded on the 1st of July, which is uh, fairly, fairly, fairly cold. Um, the question I'm often asked is what's the driver for this? So where, where is the climate change or the anthropogenic change coming into this? There's a bit of a paradox. We've got this warming going on across the year, but then we've got this increase in frostiness. How do you, how do you compute those two things? Well, we know that there's an anthropogenic or, or a human-induced change on the synoptic circulation that occurs across Australia. And some work that I've done with colleagues, and, and you can see the reference for that in the International Journal of Climatology, showed, or what we looked at was to try and understand the change in the synoptic drivers of, of frost uh, and, and these extreme minimum temperature occurrences. So we looked at things like uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation, we looked at blocking, we looked at the Southern Annular Mode, and we looked at the Subtropical Ridge. All of these things have a strong influence on minimum temperatures. And what you can see there is a comparison between the earlier part of the record and the later part of the record. And if you draw your attention to the September, October, November maps, those two bottom maps, what you can see is that there's been a significant change in the most important driver of minimum temperature variability. So in the most recent times in September, October, November over Victoria, that, southern, that subtropical ridge, the intensity and the position of that subtropical ridge has had a much more important effect on minimum temperature variability than in the past. So we can see that there are some anthropogenic changes to the synoptic drivers. We've also been asked to give some sense of, well, can we actually think about or can we quantify the impact that these changes in frost risk have actually had on cereal crop production? And so using the APSIM uh, model and looking at, at some simple um, wheat simulations, what we're able to do is look at comparing the earlier part of the record with the later part of the record and comparing the proportion of pro productivity loss to frost in the earlier part with the later part for a range of different crop varieties from short season right through to long season and for different planting times. So these maps just reflect the 18th of May as an indicative planting time every year um, for, for that record going back from 1960 through to 2015. So the areas in red show where the most recent part of the record um, has experienced more frosts or production losses as a, as a function of frost. So what you can see there, it, it, irrespective of variety or irrespective of planting time, the changes that we've seen in frosts characteristics across the southern parts of, of, of Australia have resulted in greater proportion of losses in wheat production. And we've quantified those, as I said, in, in that paper. So the very last question that I'm asked is one of, well, what does, what does this mean for the future? Can we get some sense of what the frost risk will be like in the future? And so we've done some work looking at a range of different global climate models. Um, and we've looked at, as you can see there on the map, a fairly small area um, where that frost signal is very strong, that change in the frost signal is very strong. And through that work, which is submitted to the, the uh, climate dynamics, should hopefully be coming out fairly shortly, 
what we show is that the frequency of, of, um, of frosts and the window over which they occur are very, very similar to, to uh, in the future, in 2030, to what they are uh, currently. After 2030, there tends to be a significant decline in frost frequency um, as the warming signal overtakes the, uh, the, the, the frost sort of behaviour. So, in my view, I think this change in frost characteristics represents a climate surprise. Now, in the inimitable words of Donald Rumsfeld, you know, if, if this climate surprise is a known known, or a known unknown, or an unknown unknown, well, I'll leave that up to you to decide. Thank you very much.